Hi, welcome to ETF Edge, your go-to place for everything exchange-traded funds. I'm your host, Bob Pisani. Estimates for the stock market in 2023, they're all over the map. With the fundamentals so cloudy, many are looking to technical and trend-following analysis, and there's an ETF for that. CNBC contributor Katie Stockton is the founder and managing partner of Fairlead Strategies and the portfolio manager for the Fairlead Tactical Sector ETF. The symbol is TAC. TACK. Also joining us, Ben Levine, Chief Financial Officer of 3DL Capital Management. Katie, uh, your ETF started in March and it uses a sector rotation strategy. You toggle between equities, sectors, S&P sectors, treasuries, gold. How does this work? Where is it invested now? So we have a model that we've developed based on our long-term methodology. So we're really trying to identify sectors that have the best long-term upside momentum. And when the market doesn't allow for a lot of that, then we move into these risk-off categories, including the short-term treasuries, long-term treasuries, and gold. So right now it's very highly risk-off because only the energy sector via the energy sector spider ETF or XLE is exhibiting those positive characteristics that we identify in our model. Yeah, so this is, as you see here, it's rebalanced monthly. So this is really tactical. You could move around a lot here, but look at what's here. It's treasuries. You're 30% in long-term treasuries, 30% in short-term, 22% in gold. The only equity exposure you have is, is energy. So what conditions would need to exist for you to flip this over and suddenly have a larger equity exposure? What would have to happen? Yeah, so it would really have to be a top-down event, right, where the S&P 500 becomes more oversold than it is already on a long-term basis and actually starts to react to that by seeing the long-term momentum indicator shift and or oversold buy signals. There's a combination of factors that we're looking for to trigger essentially the end to the bear market cycle, and that's when we would expect TAC as the ETF to ramp up very quickly to a full sector exposure. A full sector exposure would look like eight sector ETFs, none of the risk off categories. Uh, but for now, we're pretty comfortable being more risk off. We do think that the market has another downdraft yeah. in store. And not surprisingly, I, it's not obvious looking at that chart, but you have much lower volatility in the S&P 500, which of course makes sense. You own treasuries in here. So if the S&P goes up rather dramatically, you don't tend to rise, obviously. And if it goes down a lot, you don't tend to fall nearly well, as much. Not, much not when, yeah, not when the holdings are yeah, as such, this, yeah. but, but in an environment where it does have that sector exposure, our primary goal is to out perform essentially yeah. you know not only participate but actually beat the broader market by being in the sectors that have that yeah. best long-term momentum and relative strength. And, and Ben you uh, actually use your practitioner you actually use e ETFs. Yes. Uh, you, you have a turnkey platform for financial advisors. You provide uh, mid back office support uh, but also you do strategic asset allocation using ETFs. Explain how 3DL works. So we are a managed model provider, um, but also a turnkey service provider for the independent financial advisor who is looking to have more home office type support, but maintain an independent practice. Uh, that way they can focus more on their value add, which is financial planning, which is building their book of business and so forth, and leaving all the pain points to us as a platform provider. So not only do we provide, as, a, as an investment strategist, managed models, including cost-effective ETFs, but we also provide the mid and back office support, such as uh, portfolio accounting, investment reporting, model rebalancing dealing with the custodians, again, all those pain points that advisors deal with in their everyday practice. So the I, I talk to people all the time, they're ex-Morgan Stanley, you know, wealth management guys, and they want to go into their own business. Uh, so who's a, is that a typical client? I mean, RIAs like, that are setting up their own shop, for example, you know, you, it's typically used, this is typically used by, it seems like people who may not have a deep investment backdrop. So maybe they don't want to set up their own back office. Uh, they don't want to necessarily personally pick and choose their own mm -hmm. investments. They want to use model portfolios. Sure. Who's, am I right? Who's the yes. client here? What's great about the financial advisor industry is it, it's a spectrum of backgrounds. So you have people, for instance, brought up on the insurance side who can tear apart an insurance contract and annuity contract, but are not as, doesn't have as much knowledge in the investment side. And then you have, for on the other side of the spectrum, the former Morgan Stanley rep who wants to go out on their own and do independent financial planning. Well, they may have an investment background, but they have also limited bandwidth. They can't do everything. So the advisor needs to make that decision, do I buy or do I build? 
Do I build my in-house capabilities, which isn't just investment, but it's also compliance because they're SEC, there's SEC oversight. And, um, and then there's all the reporting and, and making sure that you have systematic processes in place to run a smooth operation. The Morgan Stanley uh, at Planner used to be able to rely on the home office for much of that support in return for a rev share. Well, now that they're on their own, they're finding that they may retain more of their revenue, but they still need that support. And so that's where a turnkey platform can come in and right. provide the level of support depending on what the advisor needs. Yeah, and they're not, they're not accountants. If I'm an RIA working at Morgan Stanley, I'm used to having Morgan Stanley take care of the whole back office stuff. I'm not doing the taxes. I'm not making sure, you know, people get paid and things like that. I, I want to focus on building a client base. Mm -hmm. So let's assume I understand the turnkey concept. How about picking stuff? I mean, uh, the reason this show exists is because ETFs are being widely used by the investor, sure. community, particularly the RIA community, because it's cheaper, lower cost. You ha explain how you use ETFs. Can I, if I'm an old Morgan Stanley guy, I want to open my own shop, I, I hire you for back office stuff. What about model portfolios? Do you, do you can I log into Vanguard or BlackRock's model portfolio? Do you have your own model ETF portfolios? Do I build them? For each individual client, sure. how does that that investment as side as a work? platform? We provide both, so we provide both access to third-party managed models like a BlackRock or in Vanguard through our technology uh, partners. We also provide our own proprietary models, and the, and the reason why some advisors might prefer going to the in-house proprietary route is one, we're third-party, so we're not a fund provider putting models out there invested in our own funds. It's independent third-party model provider. Um, but we also do so in a way where we believe we pick the best areas in the markets from a cost-effective standpoint and from a risk premium standpoint that we believe best compensate investors for the risks that they're taking in their portfolios, whether in equity or fixed income. So we are strategic asset allocators in the sense that we do not tactically move around the markets in equities and fixed income, but from time to time, we will make changes where we believe that risk reward is skewed in favor or perhaps against uh, the investor yeah. from, from a long-term standpoint. Do, do you find most of your, your clients, your RAs, for example, are they themselves tactical managers? Will, will they simply uh, buy your model and buy and hold, or will they actually recommend situations where like Katie's involved and where you're, you're tactical allocated, you're moving things around. Sure. Mm -hmm. think, of, think of us as providing that basic building block, that basic foundation for an investment program where at the core you have the asset allocation for long-term risk exposures. Then as you move up from the foundation, you can consider things like tactical strategies or alternative illiquid type of strategies, or perhaps you as the RI have a specific expertise that you believe you have um, uh, expertise in, in being able to allocate to uh, above and beyond kind of those other founding, uh, th those other building block foundations. So just to give an example, I talked to an RA who came from the agricultural industry, knows the agricultural inside and out, does agricultural based investments. He didn't have the time though to focus on the other aspects of the investment program. He'd rather leave that to the other building blocks, the other foundation providers, so that he can focus more of his time on what he believes he's truly an expert at, which is ag-based investing. Yeah, so you, you can focus your models on different things, for example, factor investing, if I want to yes. buy uh, value or size or profitability, you can basically tailor it to whatever the RIA wants. Yes, so our investment philosophy is predicated on Fama French, the classic three-factor or five-factor uh, risk-based model, so that we are providing risk premiums not just to the markets, equities and fixed income, but premiums within the market, such as value, size, profitability, things that uh, risk premiums that have been sourced through financial academic literature and, and are seen as sustainable and rational as well. You should be compensated, for instance, for being invested in value stocks because they are riskier in the sense that their growth outlook is less certain or perhaps they're more financially leveraged and that leverage feeds through in terms of their overall earnings behavior. So uh, we believe that rationally being exposed to uh, those risk premiums over the long run compensates you even though there might be volatility in the short yeah. term. So the, what is the RA community 
saying to you now? What, do they have particular concerns or interests this year? Is there something unusual going on? As we go into 2023, sure. this community is getting bigger and bigger. There's more private managers out there, advisors, more of them using ETFs. You talk to them. What are they what are they telling you now? So 2022 is when we all discovered bond math for the first time in the sense that duration acts like beta, just like beta acts like with inequities. And in the sense that the, the price, the return that you see in your portfolios to bonds depends on changes in interest rates as well as interest rate volatility. So this year, this past year, uh, to the point where the 10-year Treasury got up to 4.5%, we saw a nearly 3% move in interest rates. Well, your typical bond portfolio has roughly six or seven years of duration in it. So now you're looking at 15 to 20% loss in portfolio. Advisors nor their clients have seen that kind of magnitude of loss for the last 70 years. I mean, this is, this is kind of an unprecedented period that we're having uh, in the fixed income space. So the equity market volatility is one thing. I think most investors and most advisors are educated to expect to see that kind of volatility in equity. They're not educated to expect that kind of volatility in fixed income like we're seeing this year. Those are the kinds of conversations and discussions that we're having. And the inquiries that we're getting from advisors are like, look, how can I lock in fixed income without experiencing the kind of volatility that we've experienced this last year? And it might mean having to look outside of the investment landscape and looking at other type of products that can insulate you from that kind of volatility, whether it's insurance-based products or bank products. It's all a matter of trade-offs, liquidity, mark-to-market, pricing, uh, locking in yields. These are things that advisors are now having to contend with for the first time that they've not had to contend with in quite a while. Yeah, and we've seen, for example, buffered products become really big this year. So these are products provide equity exposure, and then you get uh, some exposure to the downside. What we've seen ki uh, equity kickers where they're selling options the call options, collecting the premium, mm -hmm. uh, and hoping the market moves in the right direction for them. So unusual strategies uh, have, have done well this year. And your strategy, you know, tactical models, trend following models, well, Katie, have done really well. There has You've to been be doing that for years. Risk. Yeah, I mean, there really has to be, especially in this environment. I think it draws people to my discipline, which is technical analysis, because we are somewhat unemotional and unbiased. You know, we, we're not looking at the company's fund fundamentals and getting married to that uh, sort of growth trend, but rather respecting the market when it loses that momentum. And it tends to leave no stone unturned. So you have to have a way to stay invested um, through this type of environment as well. And to his point, the challenge has really been just the dual bear market in treasuries because yeah. that caught a lot of people off guard. Yeah. Um, I just want to get clear with the viewers how you charge for access to the platform. So we have your technology, have mid back office charge. Um, suppose, I mean, for example, uh, I... I I'm the RIA. I, I'm, you're charging me, um, pick a number, 60 basis points or something. Not that whatever, high. All right, whatever it is. <laughs> uh, and am I charging a fee on top of that? How does it, how does it work sure. if I'm running, an, if I want to run an RIA, a business like this, how does, how does a fee structure so work? So assuming you come on uh, as, a, as a representative of 3D, where 3D serves, in essence, the RIA on record as far as the custodian's concerned, we basically do an all-in-one encompassing fee that incorporates you, your fee, the, the financial advisor fee, as well as the platform fee. And the fee that we charge on our platform, this is all disclosed in our ADV, is there is a platform delivery fee, so access to the platform itself. Think of that as the technology fee. And then there's what's called the model delivery fee. And that model delivery fee is either a fee we charge if you are invested in our models, uh, or it's a fee that's charged by a third-party model provider that you may access through our technology. It, but, but the two are distinct. The, the technology platform fee is distinct from the model delivery fee. And then you as the advisor uh, charge your own fee on top of that. And then depending on your arrangement, um, uh, the selling arrangement that you have with 3D, we will handle your billing to the client on your behalf, and we do monthly billing. So if I say you're going to charge me whatever... 50 basis or whatever we're going to charge and I need to get 40 basis points minimum and I ultimately the client will be charged 90 basis points. Sure. It's going to be something like yes. on those so levels. That, that's what the client sees and then how it's deconstructed or how it's charged. You know, we charge our fee 
your fee is charged, and then we will forward on to you the fees that are passed on from that total fee that's charged to the client. You know, I know you're not in this business, Katie, but this kind of turnkey solutions seem to be gaining a lot of adherence. We've done this several times this year. More people go into this financial advisory business. Um, I, don't, I don't know where this type of, of, of service fits in in the overall uh, yeah. investment landscape, yeah, I mean, it, but it's growing it's, for yeah, sure. Yeah, there's definitely a demand for it. And in, in developing our own ETF, we were kind of addressing a similar need on the advisory front. So we found that the traction has really been very strong from the RIA you know, environment. And, and I think it's because a lot of them were trying to do this tactical or strategic allocation themselves. And they were doing so with limited success because they weren't approaching it systematically. So here you have solutions solutions, right, that are, are kind of doing it for you, so you can go focus on the rest of your business. Yeah. One of the remarkable things to me, I, I have been covering ETFs for 20 years, and it's the ocean of money that just keeps coming in. Here we have one of the worst years since 2008, and we still have $500 billion in inflows into ETFs yeah. this year, um, much the, even with bonds down. Much of this is money that keeps coming out of mutual funds going into ETF structures, but most of it is still just oceans of money going into plain vanilla, you know, S&P 500 ETFs, Russell 1000 ETFs, um, triple Qs, NASDAQ 100 right. ETFs, just slow every year. And it, it seems to be price insensitive. It just keeps yeah. coming in, up year, up, mm -hmm. down year, up inflows still coming in. And just imagine when the 401ks allow it even more. Yes, and that right. is the final business that hasn't been cracked right. yet. And of course, that business is, as you know, way too lucrative. Uh, when will that happen? When will ETFs finally crack? Them? Record keepers are the gatekeepers. So record keepers, for now at least, still prefer to have mutual funds as the primary investment vehicle to the plans that they re that are well, record kept. They prefer kept. because there are higher fees associated. Is there another reason? Part of its execution. I mean, think about how ETFs can be executed, for instance, intraday. So, so the technology to be able to get the kind of seamless type of uh, allocation and distributions that are normally handled through a mutual fund vehicle. Now you have to incorporate intraday considerations as well, and you have to worry about pricing and execution on top of that. So, record keepers, if they are going to give access or allow access to uh, include ETFs as part of the plan lineup, they're going to basically charge a higher fee to the end participant or the plan sponsor to get access to it. So, um, so really for ETF adoption to pick up more broadly in the 401k or the, or the ERISA uh, plan space that, that is record kept, you need to see record keepers be able to offer that at scale all on par with what they currently do with mutual funds and we're not quite there yet. There's no way to just say, okay, everyone's going to, like mutual funds, everyone's going to get the last price at the end of the day. You can't do that. You're saying you'd have to open it up to intraday trading, essentially? So, so basically, may, maybe not open it up to intraday trading, but you have to keep track of that execution mm -hmm. and making sure that in the end, you're achieving best execution on behalf of the plan participant. Not only that, but the cash flows um, are, uh, uh, although they are periodic in the sense that they're payroll driven, let's say that a, an immediate distribution is being made um, and it's, it's sort of unexpected. And so you go in and you execute that, um, you have to basically be able to keep track of how you executed yeah. it unlike a mutual fund where all you have to do is just refer to the end of day close. Yeah, yeah, it's a tough one. All right, folks, uh, better fascinating discussion as always. That does it for this week's ETF Edge. I'm Bob Pisani. My thanks to Katie and Ben. Now, thank you for watching. You can find all of our latest videos here on our website, etfedge.cnbc.com. We've asked Katie to stick around to give us more details on her 2023 outlook for the ETF Edge podcast. That's coming up. Everybody have a healthy, happy, and safe trading week. Get the ABCs of ETFs with the ETF Edge newsletter, your weekly update on the hottest trends, expert analysis, actionable ideas, and exclusive insight from host Bob Pisani. Sign up now at CNBC.com forward slash ETF Edge newsletter.